Okay, so what would you do? What would Rob Luna invest in right now if someone had an, uh, you know, hundred k to throw around? You know, hundred k. I mean, I think you know one of the things we're putting our money in right now, quite honestly, is private companies. When you look at, you know, a lot of, you know, I'm looking at for right now, for example, um, an auto body shop. You know, these these are guys that just got a contract from Allstate, good hands people. They are, uh, you know, basically swamped. The challenge with this guy is. Allstate will only send him a certain amount of cars based off of square footage. He's in, Al- in Los Angeles. So square footage in Los Angeles is incredibly expensive. I went down to his shop. I like to validate and verify things. He was taking up the alley with automobiles. He has neighbors complaining on him. He, all he needs to do is extend open another shop. The guy doesn't have the money to do that. I've talked to Allstate and said, yeah, we've got a backlog that we'd like to send him. The guy has all these certifications. 25 to 30 percent cash on cash return very very difficult to get that in public markets those are the things when i can go out there see what's going on feel it look at audited financials balance sheets and also working with entrepreneurs when i look at what he's doing and i feel that i could add some value to that situation to maybe get those money that margin to 35 40 those are the types of deals that i like to get in brad you know one of the things we're saying blanket today real estate gold commodities the stock market, there is no deals out there. On any historical metric, everything is fairly valued to expensive or really expensive. So you need to find those deals where you do have that competitive edge, where you can add some value, bring some value to the deal. So if it's real estate, you're finding those off-market deals that maybe haven't hit the market. Uh, If it's, you know, companies, it's really those private deals. You can get in and kind of lever them up. The private markets are really where you want to be today. So as a, as a asset class, look at private equity, companies like Blackstone, KKR that are out there raising funds that are now coming to individual investors at smaller amounts, 50000 100000 because the pension fund clients are going away. These types of private market deals are becoming more available to the average investor than ever before. What about silver? <laughs> well, they say silver is the poor man's gold, right? And so, you know, usually there's a high correlation between a move up in gold and a move up in silver. I personally have never invested in gold other than what I wear on my wrist and around my neck uh, for, for a couple of reasons. Number one, when you try to value gold, I ask any of these gold guys, well, how do you actually value it? There's no valuation metrics to be able to t- understand what it should be worth. When I buy a company, I can look and say, okay, here's your earnings. Historically, we're going to pay five to seven times earnings. That's what the market trades at. On gold, there's really no way to tell that. The other issue about gold is there's no dividends that are paid out of gold. So if you put those gold coins in your drawer, that's nice. But the only way you're going to make money is if those gold coins go higher at some point and you're going to be able to sell them to somebody else. We're off the gold standard. If we still on the gold standard in the U.S. where the dollar was actually tied to something tangible like gold, then I'd be all in on gold. But ever since we got away from that, it's been very, very hard to value gold. So I'm not a big metals investor just because I can't get cash flow from metal. What is cash flow the key? Cash flow is king, right? You know, for example, you know, I sold my business for several millions of dollars this, this year. The challenge is, and I didn't sell all of it, I sold 70%. I wanted to keep 30% in the deal. The reason being is every million dollars that they gave me, my cash flow, my return on equity of the million dollars that I kept in my business was about 24, 25%. So I'm not retiring them anytime soon. I'm in my 40s. I'm going to be working for another 20 years. Once I took that money out of the business, I needed to put it somewhere where I can get an equivalent rate of return. Our savings account's paying nothing. So every day I have it in there, I'm losing money. The stock market, look, you're going to get 8 9%. It's not going to be 20%. So that's why I'm out talking to guys at the body shop and some of these private deals where I could see higher rates of return. I could put some sweat equity in the form of getting in there and helping them improve their business to get that 25 30% back. But it's not easy. So the average guy that's selling a business, selling a piece of real estate today, bringing in a million bucks, you might want to think twice about that because if you had seven, eight, nine percent cash flow coming from your rentals, if you're selling a business where you're cash flowing 15 to 20 percent, it sounds nice to get that lump sum of money. But you know, like I work with professional athletes, right? They get this big check, 20, 30 million dollars, might be 80 percent of their lifetime net earnings. So they see this big dollar there, but it's the cash flow that that generates. So when I tell them, okay, 
on $20 million, first of all, cut that in half because ta- half goes to taxes. Now you got $10 million, right? And so if you got $10 million that you're getting 4 to 5% on, that's four to 500000 So that $20 million check that you got is really a $400,000 lifestyle. But yet they bought the $10 million house and the cars and all those things. So cash flow is king. You don't get a lump sum and spend it all in one day. That's going to last you. It's the money that comes out of that. That's what is able to support your lifestyle. So cash flow is everything. So you think 4 or 5% is average? 45% distribution is average right now. You put it, it's, it's all perspective, right? So one thing as an investor, we teach people, you always look at the risk-free rate. Anything, real estate, private businesses, the stock market, the risk-free rate, what you're going to get over the next 10 years is the 10-year government treasury bond, right? Today, that pays three quarters of a percent. You're not getting anything. So if I'm going to invest, well, I got to look at that because I know the government for the next 10 years is going to pay me something. Today, it's three quarters of a percent. Anything above that, obviously, is good. But, you know, I started in the market in 1998, and we remember the big crash in 2000. In 1998, that risk-free rate, the government bonds were paying 7%. So it's a huge hurdle, right? It's like, okay, no risk, and I get seven. That sounds pretty good. Why would you stick in the stock market that's yielding 1% at that time that's trading at nosebleed valuations? Today, everyone's like, why isn't the stock market going down? Well, the 10 years at three quarters of a percent. The S&P yields 2%. So even if the market does nothing for the next decade, you get two times the cash flow at a more favorable tax rate than you do in treasuries. That's why the stock market's not going down. It proves the point. It's all about cash flow. Pension funds, endowment funds, the big money that moves the market, they need the cash flow to pay those retirees, to pay the next building that they're going to build for the Harvard endowment. It's the cash flow. It's not the principal that they live off of. What about um, like a, let's say, multifamily house or multifamily apartment building that pays 15% a year? If you could find a multifamily house today that's yielding 15%, that's a great deal. I mean, we're not really seeing them. It's more 6 to 7%, which is part of an overall portfolio. Makes sense. Goes back to that 4 or 5% that I'm, that I'm talking about. So once you start diversifying that, that's kind of where you're at. Multifamily, great asset class in terms of commercial real estate. That's actually considered commercial real estate. It's been the highest risk-adjusted return, meaning you've had the lowest volatility versus something like industrial warehouse, class A commercial office that we talked about. It's a nightmare. Uh, hospitality, hotels. Multifamily makes a lot of sense as part of your, your overall strategy. What about this building right here I'm in? Yeah, this building, well, do you own the, you own the building? Nope. No. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't want to be part of it. I don't want anything. <laughs> That's why you asked me if I owned it first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't want to offend you. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's, it is different though, right? Because... I was going to buy it last year for $21 million before COVID. Yeah. And... Uh, it's probably cheaper now. Well, that's the thing. Like, coincidentally, my lease on this, I, I got the whole floor. Okay. And then downstairs, I got a quarter of the floor. And my lease is up January 1. Mm-hmm. And 70 employees went home on COVID. Only 15 came back. The rest of them, I don't care if they're home. It's actually better for right. me. They're more productive. They don't drink my 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 Red Bulls and shit. <laughs> so it's like, I'm thinking about, you know, I don't even need this floor anymore. So yeah. why don't I just give up? like half the floor. And then I started to think, dude, what if I'd own this building? Like right. I'd be screwed. You're validating the long-term thesis that I'm talking about in terms of vest- investing, right? I mean, people don't need that much space anymore. You're just seeing larger and larger vacancies. You have companies like Facebook and Google saying a large part of our work stuff is going to be work for home from home forever. I mean, they're, they're making this claim now. So that concerns me. And really not, it wasn't about offending you because you don't offend very easily. It was really more about if you own this, right, well, you'd have to rent somewhere else anyway, right? So that's a different dynamic versus you just being a, 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 a passive investor and buying this and renting it out because it is, it's just like when you buy your own primary residence, that's always a more favorable investment than buying that second primary residence and renting it out because you have to put that money for rent somewhere anyway. That being said, $21 million, I'd have to do the numbers. Uh, it, it, there's a huge amount of risk because – you know, especially, I mean, look at, and then you got to figure real estate, we talk about it now like it's this commodity, Well, real estate is very local. When you look at the local economy in Vegas, you know, I, I rode over here at the car driver, they laid off half the workforce there. There's no conventions that are coming back here. I'm staying at the wind right now for like $1,000 a night for a $5,000 a night room. How long is that going to last? Look at what's going on in Florida. They reopened Disney World a few months ago, not one single issue. How is that not something that's looked at and addressed when when you're making policy? 
it's all politics, right? And so that's that's the challenge. I don't know. If you tell me what the political environment's going to look like in six months from now, seven months from now, maybe I'd have a better idea. But right now, I don't know. Maybe it is a year, well, maybe well, it's two years. Let's say Trump wins. How's yeah. it going to look in six months? Well, I think from that standpoint, in terms of back to business as usual, it happens a lot quicker. And that's not necessarily making a political statement. It's just more about policy. It's just the policy that's been articulated from both sides you know, regulatory, the regulatory environment, right? All those things that we've seen under Trump that have been more business friendly. What so, if you were on Fox News and they asked you who you're voting for? Can you say it? Yeah, I, I, don't talk, I don't talk about that. But I think, you know, at the end of the day, the way we invest our money, uh, that I'm very outspoken about policy. I'm telling you right now, I think Trump, hands down, like him or not, is much more favorable for business owners, much more favorable for business. I mean, that's, that's just policy. I mean, Brad, if you make $100 and 35 of that goes to the government versus 21, what's better? 21. Yeah, of course. It's just simple economics. So that's not making a political statement. It's just talking about policy. Especially when the government wastes their money. Well, that's exactly it. They act like you pay more and everybody gets more help. That's not true. No, that's not it. And, and they also believe that that... The more that you pay in taxes, that creates programs that are going to incentivize people to go out to work. I, I, again, I work with entrepreneurs that have real businesses. For a lot of them in the lower demographics of pay, those people left because they were getting more to pay more to sit home, six hundred dollars a week on their couch than work. So we incentivize them not to work to stay home. Like that's what you got to think of, right? And to me. That type of policy is appalling. Like I told you from the beginning, I, I grew up extremely poor, right? It wasn't the government that, that saved me. It was, it was capitalism that saved me. It was education that saved me. It was the ability to go out and build a business that allowed me to be in the position that I'm in today. So when I hear these things, I, I think it's absolutely appalling. Did you guys hear my sound effect? <laughs> so you said you, were, you, you grew up poor? Yeah, I grew up extremely poor. Yeah. yeah, my my dad left when I was real young. My mom, it was a story a lot of people know, got hooked on drugs, wasn't even you did? paid attention. What's that? What kind of drugs? Or your mom got hooked my on mom, drugs? My mom, my oh. mom. Yeah, what no, kind I, of drugs? Fortunately, I didn't. Cocaine, primarily. Who, who knows what else? I was 9, 10 years old. I, I didn't know other than she wasn't home sometimes. Two, three days uh, at a time, we'd go in the refrigerator and, you know, she wasn't even functional enough to apply for government ben benefits. There wasn't even any money there. Right. And so, you know, when I hear all these stories about, oh, you got to support this and support that and create this. Program, yeah, I'm all for government programs as a bridge to getting people out on their own and doing things. I'm not government for government programs that incentivize people to stay home, to work less, that are going to create greater government fraud for the, for that we already have. Yeah. But when it sounds like, you know, he's went to Wharton, he's, yeah. he's you know, you sound like you came from a. Yeah, I, upper class family that put you through college. How'd you get to Wharton? I did. I didn't. You know, I, I basically I got a scholarship when I was younger. I started out at a junior college. I, I was wrestling. Then I went to Arizona State. It was my first uh, exposure to university. That was just because an opportunity opened up for me. And it was later on in life when I got into fine. I never even, when I was twenty years old. I never even heard of Wharton. To be honest with you. Do you think if you didn't learn what you learned about money, you'd be in the position you're in now? No. No, it, you know, what it is, it's just, that's the path, you know, in terms of an entrepreneur, I'm not one of these guys, I'm just not brilliant enough um, to create something from scratch. You know, I'm not going to create the next Uber. Uh, I'm not going to create the next Tesla. I'm just not that guy. Uh, so what I needed to do was find an industry that already worked. <laughs> it happened to be finance. And then my whole goal was just to become the smartest guy in that industry. And that's what I strive to be every day. And that's what allowed me to, to basically build a position on them. But being in that industry and in finance, it is more of a traditional level of education that I had to go out and invest in myself to do that because I wasn't smart enough like some of these guys to, to create YouTube and sell it to Google, unfortunately. Well, and, and also, it always doesn't have to be Uber and YouTube and, yeah. and no, no, Google. No. Like, dude, Lightspeed does pretty well. Yeah, Lightspeed does well. Look, I'm talking to this guy, right? He's first generation um, in this country from Mexico. He started a body shop. The guy's making great money. That's what I mean. Didn't even graduate from high school, right? So there, there's a ton of opportunity out there for entrepreneurs. And that's the whole idea, right? When you talk about society today, I mean, it's a challenge, right? Because General Motors is paying you a pension. I had some you know, friends that uh, you know, went, went and worked for Boeing right out of school. They're lucky enough to make that pension cut off. Those days are gone.